Hello, everyone. This is Bethlehem Artfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a story. Subahat Gebrek Zaber, who was born in 1936 and passed away in 2012, was a highly acclaimed Ethiopian author. He is mainly known for his explicit narration of his experiences in the 1950s in Wibe Baraha, a neighborhood in Addis Ababa known for its lively dance clubs, bars, and prostitution. His short stories, on the other hand, are based on the experiences of Ethiopian society at large. Wendy Kindred, who translated some of these short stories into English, said, "Subah tells his stories." With empathy for the characters and a sly humor for their predicament. Today, I'll be reading his short story entitled "Seed," translated by Wendy Kindred. In the next episode, I'll read an excerpt I translated from Leto Mina Galing, probably one of the most racy books ever written in Amharic. Birke's mother raised chickens and brewed dalla to make enough money to feed the two of them. Every evening, customers came to drink dalla, and every morning there was enough kolo left over for Birke's breakfast. This morning, one look at the kolo made Birke feel sick, so she wrapped some in newspaper and took it with her. When she tried again to eat it on the way to school, it made her feel so sick. That she gave it to her friends, she was afraid that her mother would discover her secret. It was just three months before the eighth grade exam. Her mother worked so hard to give her an education. How could she confess that she was pregnant now? What would her mother do when she found out? Curse her? Kill her? She could hardly bear to think about the distress that she would cause her mother. The only solution was to tell Damto and count on him to marry her, or help her in some other way. But when she told Damto, he took a long drag on his cigarette and exhaled. Through the smoke, he said, "What proof do you have that this child is mine?" She could hardly believe her ears. There was no trace of the genial, affectionate man she thought she knew. Confused, Brigitte said. Do I need a proof? Yes, but this bed bears witness. And how many beds are there? And how many witnesses? Without another word, Brigitte got dressed and left. Why has God given her such beauty? Why had He made men so fickle? She had no answer to these questions. One day in school, Brigitte stayed in the classroom when everyone else left. Her best friend Azeb came searching for her and found her crying. "What's wrong? What happened?" Azeb asked. "Tell me. Let me share your trouble, please." Tearfully, Brigitte confessed her secret to Azeb. "Saint Michael will know what to do," Azeb consoled her. Brigitte dried her tears, and the two girls walked home together. It was a blessing to have a friend like Azeb who could offer hope in such a dark time. Birke waited another month and a half, but her doubts and fears only grew. What about the eighth grade exam? How could she pass when all she could think of was her pregnancy? And what would her mother do when she found out about it? She thought about trying to induce a miscarriage, but when she told Azeb what she was thinking, Azeb said. No, it's too dangerous. Don't try that. Still, what else could Birke do? She remembered what her mother once told her: "How could I be angry with God for not giving me a child of my own when you became my child? I lost my sister, but she gave you to me." The next Saturday, Birke made an infusion of bitter endowed leaf. And drank it. She hoped it would make her miscarry on the weekend, and that by Monday she would be fine again and no longer pregnant. By Sunday, however, she was so sick that Azeb became frightened and told Birke's mother what had happened. Birke's mother was overwhelmed when she heard the news. 
She began to shake. She could not stop it. She paced back and forth, sat down, and stood up, wrung her hands, and cracked her knuckles over and over, ten times or more. Birgit watched from the bed, her eyes wide with fear, as her mother's anger gathered like a storm, and she began to curse and rage. Useless whore! She screamed. Look how I worked to raise you, and for what? What have you done? I couldn't care if you die because of this, you careless slut. I believed in you. I loved you like a daughter. I trusted you to carry my seed, but you have tried to destroy it. Then, as quickly as it had come, the storm of anger passed. Bricky's mother sat down on the edge of the bed and held her head in her hands. She let the tears flow, and they washed away her rage. Oh, my darling, she sobbed. You are my one good eye. All that I see of the future, I see through you. When my beloved sister died giving birth to you, I wanted to die too. But you gave me a new life. If you die now, there will be only darkness. Oh, you must leave, she cried. Birke reached out to touch her mother and their hands entwined. Azeb left them alone like that and waited outside the door. When a customer came by asking for Dalla, she told him there was none and sent him on his way. At last, Brigitte's mother opened the door again. Her face was serene. Come in, she said to Azeb. The coffee is getting cold. Birgit's mother gathered all the money she had saved for a rainy day and took Birgit to the hospital. For 21 days, she stayed beside her bed and nurtured her back to health. By the time of the 8th grade exams, Birgit was well again and she passed with flying colors, even though her pregnancy was already showing. Then her mother said, Stay home until the baby is born. So Birke did not enroll in the ninth grade. Azeb, on the other hand, would have gone on to the ninth grade if she could have, but she failed the exam. I wish I had been the one to fail, Birke said sadly. Never wish such bad luck on yourself, Azeb responded. Birke and her mother moved to a cheaper house in another town, not far away, where the neighborhood was dirty but customers for Ella were plentiful. It was a small house and the walls leaned every which way as if fighting over space. One day, Brick's mother asked her quietly, Who is the father of your baby? My child does not need a father, Brick answered. Brick's mother bit her lip and stared at the three chickens outside the door. Then Brigitte, her eyes fixed on the chickens too, said quietly, I told him I was pregnant. He asked how I knew he was the father of my child. He is good for nothing. Don't worry, her mother answered. But how can I not worry when he made me pregnant and then disappeared? Brigitte asked. Her mother smiled at her. Do you think it's too big a burden that he gave you? But how can I bring this child? Birke asked. How did I bring you? Her mother answered. What God willed will be, and what he has not willed will not be. Oh, mother, how can you still love me as your daughter? I know what a burden I've been to you all these years. I see how you've aged because of me. Do you think it would not come to me anyway? You could have lived in comfort if it weren't for me. <laughs> Who would have kept me company if I had not raised you? With whom could I have talked? With the sofa? Or with a nylon dress? Or is it with the gold necklace? You could have had an easier life with your husband. Who said anything about a husband? Where did you get that from? Ato Beyene asked you to marry him, didn't he? When I was old enough to go to school, didn't he ask you to marry him and give me to another relative to raise? 
And didn't you refuse? Who told you that lie? Birgit's mother asked, trying to cover her surprise. Was it Manale, that liar, who told you this? He lies through his teeth. Birgit laughed. <laughs> Can't deny it, she said. I'm not denying it, her mother argued back. If you want to know the truth, it was not only one husband I refused. It was three. So what are you going to do about that now? Why did you refuse? Birgit asked gently. What if I didn't want to marry? This is a free country. Who could make me do what I didn't want to do? Was I the reason you didn't want to marry? You were one reason. I myself was another. What do you mean? Birgit's mother sighed. <sighs> oh, I don't know. Um, let's not talk about it anymore. For a moment, there was silence. Birgit's mother seemed lost in her thought, but Birgit would not give it up. I want to know, she said. Oh, yes, my jewel, <laughs> her mother laughed. It was what she called Birgit as a child. Where were you when I was born? Birgit persisted. In the city, my dear. I was having a good time with Allah and with men. I had plenty of attention from men. But when I heard you were born, I was so happy I shouted with joy. I got on a bus and came right home. Thinking about it brought a smile on her face and a faraway look to her eyes. Why did you leave your village? Birgit asked. Oh, I was reckless then. She spoke as if she was reliving the time. Then she began to tell Birgit her story. My husband was a merchant. He gave me everything a woman could ask for, like clothes, jewellery, servants. I never had to cook or wash clothes. Whenever he travelled on business, he brought me gifts, scarves or dresses or perfumes or jewellery. It was a wonderful time. He loved me and treated me so well. She paused then and was quiet for a moment before she continued. He wanted a child, but I could not conceive one. His sister tried to convince him to divorce me because I was barren, you see. But he would not do that. Then I learned that he had a child out of wedlock. So it was not always business that kept him away from home. I thought I would burn up with jealousy. I packed my things and went home to my father's house. It was not just the fact that he had an outside child that hurt me. I wanted him to have a child. More than once I almost advised him to do it. No, that was not what hurt. What I could not endure was that he did it without telling me. He betrayed me. He made me feel like a fool, a laughing stock. Still, he loved me. I knew that. He sent many messengers to my father's house to beg me to come back. Even my sister, your mother, pleaded for him. He promised me anything. What did you tell him? I told him to wipe his nose and I went to the city. I didn't want to work for anyone else, so I started to brew and sell Allah. I was beautiful in those days, just like you are, although the style was different then. They both laughed at that. For years, my husband kept begging me to return. Why didn't you? Wouldn't you have been better off with him? Yes, probably, but I could not forgive him for choosing my best friend to be the mother of his child. It made me sick at heart to think of it. That's just how it is. Then Birgit asked cautiously, What about me? How come you took me when your sister died? Ah, uh, I had to fight for you, Birgit's mother said. Your uncle wanted to raise you himself. But my sister knew how desperately I longed for a child. You were her gift to me. So how could I blame God for making me barren? Perhaps 
it was a good thing that he spared me the difficulty of childbirth after all. That's what she said, but her eyes were sad when she said it. Birke, embarrassed, looked away. A few months later, Birke gave birth to a healthy son, who was given the name Ashanathi, a soldier's name, because he had already conquered the endowed poison and probably a battle in the future over poverty ahead of him. He will be victorious, Birke's mother promised. While Birke was still recovering from childbirth, Damto came to tell her that he wanted to help raise the child. How do you know it's your child? Brigitte asked him. I trust you, he responded. If you trust me, then trust that Ashanavi is not your child, she said. There are many beds after all. He could have a different father. Forgive me, Damto pleaded. I promise to make it up to you. But Birke's refusal was firm. Damto had no choice but to give up, at least for the time being. Later on, though, Birke's mother took up his cause and spoke to Birke on his behalf. Don't ever mention his name again in Ashenafi's presence, Birke warned her. Her mother puzzled over the situation. How could this girl, Birke, born from a sister who could never say no, be so stubborn. Ah, she's just like me, she realized, and then she laughed in triumph. <laughs> she is my daughter after all, she announced happily. To Brigitte, she said, of course, Ashanavi does not need a father. He is a man unto himself. Secretly, though, Brigitte's mother went to Damto. Bide your time, she said, and when you come back, be sure to bring a priest with you. She will not say no to a priest. Thank you for listening. Please read the discussion points under the description of this episode. We would like to hear your views on these points and any other observation you may have. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they are released, please subscribe to this channel. Until the next story, goodbye.